Hello and welcome to or back to my channel. Today we're going to be looking at chapter 3 of Michelle Easton's How to Raise a Conservative Daughter. Chapter 3 is titled America is Exceptional and Worth Defending and I anticipate this to be a shorter video because on a quick read through she seems to just say the same thing over and over again. So I have my coffee and I strongly suspect, I strongly advise everyone else to have some as well because I don't know nothing she says is surprising to me but it's really just kind of boring I mean it's the same right-wing talking points you've been hearing for at least a year if not longer well I'll try to get through and well I feel like I was going to say something else but the cat started to play and now I've lost my train of thought thank you if you hear weird noises it's the cats they are high on the treat I gave them to make them behave, which clearly backfired. Anyway, so chapter three. I would also like to note real quick that she does not have sources for this chapter. So I, however, will take the liberty of providing my own. We are so blessed to live in the United States of America. Never in history has there been a freer, more prosperous, and more powerful place than the one we call home. Think about that. By what miracle did we receive such an inheritance? Well, it was kind of luck of birth that we, most people that are reading this book and watching this video was born in the United States, but okay. The answer is in every way tied to our founding principles and the sacrifices of innumerable patri patriots past and present. When parents impress this upon their daughters, gratitude and pride are sure to follow. Reverence for the flag, respect for the uniform, and a desire to defend freedom become natural impulses born from loving this great land. I'm really confused by Christians who have such like a patriotic pride because, I mean, at least back in the old days, like a hundred years ago, you weren't really supposed to be that attached to earthly things like, say, your country. So I'm very confused as to how religion became tied to patriotism. I mean, do they think there's like a heavenly version of the United States? Chief among these ideals was the solemn belief that our rights are God-given, not given to us from government. No other country in the history of the world was created on this concept. The founders understood this and made America exceptional among the nations of the world, a country where freedom and virtue could produce a nation of unrivaled prosperity and goodwill. What country is she talking about? Because the unrivaled prosperity and goodwill, I do not see it in this country or any really, I'm sure all, they might be quieter, but they probably all have their problems. Unfortunately, however, not everyone chooses to see the good in our country. So just because you point out something that needs to be fixed does not mean you hate your country. Many colleges and mass media outlets are determined to portray America in the worst possible light. It's unconscionable. Leftist propaganda makes it difficult for girls to understand our unique nature, making it all the more important for parents to be a guiding light. The New York Times, for example, has embraced the radical 1619 project, which claims our nation was not founded in 1776, but in 1619, when slaves were first brought to North America. The project asserts that the Revolutionary War was waged to defend slavery, not to overthrow an abusive monarchy. Despite gross inaccuracies, the liberal revisionist campaign is now taught in public schools. As I read through this and she keeps talking on about school, does she think there are no conservative teachers? No teachers that don't care about politics. No leftist teachers that know their politics doesn't belong in a classroom. I mean, apparently conservative people just don't become teachers and maybe that would fix their problem. Apparently even private schools are overrun with leftist teachers. Professional athletes kneel during the national anthem, protesting a nation that affords them the opportunity to make millions for playing a game. If anything, these athletes are soaked in the wonders of American capitalism, but radical activist groups have morphed them into political activists who prefer to denigrate our country rather than celebrate it. So if you make a lot of money, you're not allowed to be against anything? You just have to suck it up because you're making money? Well, I mean, I guess that would be very American, so okay. Football stars like Colin Kaepernick and U.S. women's national soccer team player Megan Rapinoe have even monetized anti-Americanism. What is anti-Americanism? Because if it's disagreeing with something your country has done or is doing, that's not anti anything that's just you know we can do better we should do better while corporate patrons like nike rake in billions of dollars from woke endorsement revenues it's a cynical exploitation that leaves many children with a false impression about their rights and opportunities really citation needed please 
If there is one thing I have learned that's worth repeating, it's that parents cannot rely on government and culture to raise their daughter. Why would you ever rely on that? Theoretically, if you have kids, you want to raise them. So the good news is that there are many ways for parents to teach girls to appreciate our exceptional country, flaws and all, and conserve the blessings that were bought and paid for by previous generations. As conservative African-American sports journalist Jason Whitlock said during a Hillsdale College lecture, a country that no longer believes in its founding ideals cannot prosper and survive. I don't think the question is that no one believes in the founding ideals, is that we see that we're not living up to them and we want to change that. But I guess that wouldn't fit the narrative that leftists are anti-American. Know your history. It's my experience that many students lack a clear understanding of our national origin. It's not their fault. Even well-raised conservative college girls struggle to articulate the ideals that make our country special. The Constitution, unprecedented wealth, and maybe the military is what they point to when asked. When parents know history and how to explain it during dinner table type discussions, they can combat misinformation and provide a positive description of where we come from and where we need to go. Well, at least that was a small acknowledgement that we still have a long way to go, I guess. American exceptionalism means that America is special and unique because we acknowledge that God, not government, gives us our rights. Government's job is to protect those God-given rights. It's a recognition that our country is unique. Most nations are built on the basis of a common ethnicity, history, culture, na national religion, or ruling family. The United States, however, stands alone in that it was built on an idea. America was founded on this idea of God-given rights. Most governments tell their people what they can do. Under our constitution, we the people tell the government it must protect our rights. So Norway, Canada, New Zealand, they, they tell their citizens what they can do. They don't have freedom in any of those countries. I'm so tired of the US pretending that we are the only free country. Yes, in the 1700s, it was a radical, funny how she's so against radical now, but it was a radical idea back then that a country would be founded on those kinds of ideals. I'm assuming everyone knows what I'm talking about. So I mean, it was great that we were built on an idea, but what have we done since? And it's ludicrous to pretend that other countries don't enjoy the same freedom that we do. So in order to um, discuss the founding with, the with their daughters and take extra steps to bring their unique history to life, she recommends taking a trip to Washington, D.C. Unfortunately, many of the great D.C. museums are run by the left and are used to promote their big government philosophy. For example, the National Portrait Gallery exhibits show how great liberal President LBJ was while stressing that President Reagan ignored AIDS. Well, I mean, he did. However, I do find it interesting that she's all, USA is great, USA is amazing, but apparently only conservative politicians are worthwhile in her eyes and anyone who was or is liberal is just, they, they just wanna like take over the country and turn it socialist. Even back in the 1950s when you know that wasn't really something that you would be doing in the US. School children today might not be overly familiar with President Ronald Reagan, for example, but when they learn about the founding, they will better understand why he took up the mantle of American exceptionalism in the face of the Soviet Union. And then she has another quote from Reagan and she really, really loves Reagan. She also worked under Bush the first and she has not mentioned him once, not even in this chapter. They were both conservative presidents. So I'm just like really curious as to why, well, as I recall, well, I don't recall because I was too young, but as I've read, Bush one was not very well loved when he left after his first term, which was why he only had one term. Maybe she's ashamed of him and that's why she never mentions or quotes him or he never really said anything quote worthy, which is a big possibility considering his son. Your daughter may be swayed by cheap rhetorical attacks on our country and the desecration of historic monuments by left-wing mobs. We didn't always live up to American exceptionalism, but the left is determined to erase and replace American history with lies. As Milan Kundera famously wrote, the first step in liquidating a people is to erase its memory, destroy its books, its culture, its history, then have someone write new books, manufacture a new culture, invent a new history. Before long, the nation will begin to forget what it is and what it was. Well, I'm torn. Part of me thinks she doesn't understand what the mobs are for. Another part of me thinks that she does and is purposely misrepresenting them in her book to make the point that she wants to make. And for some reason, despite this love of uh, personal responsibility, conservatives love to think they're being persecuted. And it's like, no, no one is going to steal your Bible and make you give up being a Christian. There's not going to suddenly become a Christian death camp where your kids can, you know, report you for being religious. It's just, it's not, it's not going to happen here. Stop trying to make it happen. 
All you're doing is making people paranoid, which is not helpful. And also, if we're all Americans, why this great divide between liberal and conservative? I mean, why can't she acknowledge that, you know, Reagan did something bad and Johnson wasn't bad <laughs> or wasn't all that bad? He's an interesting example because I don't ever really hear much about Johnson. Thank you for your service. Most people don't even think about the sacrifices of military service men and women as they go about their daily lives. While civilians are at the gym, the office, or relaxing on the couch, brave souls stand guard in faraway lands and across the world's oceans to make sure there is peace at home and that our allies are protected abroad. So after 9-11, my mom, who used to watch soap operas and Oprah, felt guilty doing that and decided that she had to watch the news 24-7. And so she rotated through the news channels for a couple weeks and then settled on Fox News. She is now a QAnon conspiracy theorist. For example, those trips abroad that your daughter can't wait to explore and enjoy, those are made possible by the American forces who make the world safer for them. The September 11 attacks, while rare instances of terrorism on U.S. soil, should remind her that strong military and intelligence services allow us to be safe here in the United States. When President Reagan directed U.S. armed forces to invade Grenada and rescue American students, the mission was only successful because we had a strong military to complete it. And as your daughter sees how her freedoms are inextricably bound to the sacrifices our troops make, her heart will naturally desire to show appreciation. So Michelle recommends thanking military members and making care packages. And if there's any military families in your community, helping them out. Combat soldier salaries certainly don't match the sacrifices our troops make. That is true. Parents also need to arm their daughters with knowledge. It's bad enough for service members and war veterans to feel taken for granted, but there is a potent anti-war left that, th that treats the military as if it's evil. So Michelle was born in 1950, and I have no doubt she saw Vietnam veterans being treated poorly by people. But in this day and age, we know that the service members and the military are two different things, and the service members have no choice in being told where to go. And we also know that despite this exceptionalism, joining the military is often the only way that you can get a college education or just some way out of poverty. Girls should know that the world is full of conflicts that require difficult choices. And when America acts, it does so to protect its people or liberate others. Really? Every time? Hmm. When the United States dropped atomic bombs on the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, our military caused unspeakable levels of destruction. But it also saved millions of lives, including that of my father. She talks about World War II and how the U.S. taxpayers funded the rebuilding of Western Europe and Japan, rather than claiming them as spoils of war. Today, Germany and Japan are free societies and economic powerhouses. The same goes for Perea. American military intervention led to a free and prosperous South, while communist North Korea remains a totalitarian nightmare. U.S. forces also came home after bitter fighting in Vietnam, and a minimal troop presence remains in Iraq and Afghanistan, mostly to provide security for those living in fear of violence. I feel this aged poorly, although it was published in July. What's extraordinary about America is that despite amassing the most powerful military and economic engine ever known, we do not indiscriminately invade and annex foreign lands, even though that is the historic norm. Instead, we gave precious human and material resources to make the world a safer, more prosperous place. First responders are heroes. First responders run toward emergencies so the rest of us can run from them. At the World Trade Center, police officers and firefighters raced to the burning building to rescue anyone they could find. Of course, the tragedy of a fallen first responder is a near daily occurrence in America. Yet the law enforcement community is now vilified on the streets and in the media. Statistics and facts prove they do not deserve such ill treatment, but rare instances of wrongdoing are amplified for ideological ends. Rare? Also, no one is vilifying paramedics and firefighters. For that matter, no one's vilifying the police. They do it to themselves. Parents can help their daughters stand up for law and order and avoid the vicious smears that now permeate left-leaning circles by teaching them to respect the law and those whose job it is to enforce it. She recommends attending a Back the Blue event with their daughter or even host one to show appreciation for law enforcement. Your daughter will naturally come to admire law enforcement when she sees that the vast majority of officers are good people, not the caricatures liberals make them out to be online and in partisan news. Your daughter will also realize that good cops are often put in impossible situations and that they generally have no tolerance for bad apples within their ranks. Really? If there are statistics about how law enforcement does not deserve such ill treatment, which would be a weird thing to study, is she sure that's what she meant? But if there are statistics and facts, why did she not provide them in this chapter? And firefighters get one paragraph 
and paramedics are not mentioned at all, which is interesting. Fight for the American dream. The American dream is alive and well, and your daughter should ignore anyone who tells her otherwise. Yeah, just ignore people who tell you things that you don't want to hear. Hard work and upper mobility are hallmarks of traditional America, and people come from all over the world for a chance to earn a better life. If identity politics is to be believed, these people should turn around and run the other way. Try as they may, liberals who wish to disparage our country cannot square the reality that millions upon millions of people work their way to prosperity or come here to experience a land of opportunity. It's funny, but it looks to me like a lot of the people who work their way to prosperity already started out with, you know, pretty prosperous parents. Also, if you're in Guatemala, the U.S. is probably looking pretty good to you right now. I mean, if you're in a country that is poor and there's a lot of drug dealing and violence and things like that, the U.S. is going to look pretty great, especially with the nearest country that is stable and fairly safe. I'd also like to know millions upon millions? Although I guess it depends on how you define prosperity. I mean, is prosperity having like a roof over your head and food in your fridge? Is prosperity having the roof, the food, and a retirement account? <laughs> the left likes to say that the reason America is exceptional, if they'll even concede as much, is because of our economic success. In other words, were it not for our wealth, we'd be just another land mass occupied by ordinary people. Well, I mean, I think that we are an ordinary land mass occupied by ordinary people either way. The fact that we have such wealthy people in, co in such small numbers and so many desperately poor people is just disgraceful with the amount of wealth that we have. Of course, Michelle does not take that view. This is, of course, absurd. For one, many of our founding fathers were poor. There were no colleges, no libraries, no world-class healthcare facilities at the time of our founding. Moreover, our founding fathers left other countries that had better economies and services in order to come to America. And why did they do that? Because they longed for a new, indeed exceptional, form of limited government that recognized that individual rights flow from God, not rulers. This feels very revisionist history to me. Wait, was that it? Usually when you say for one, there's something else that follows, but I guess that was her only point on this, okay. This should be a source of great pride for your daughter. Teach her that freedom and opportunity are magnets for humanity. Young people are indoctrinated with the opposite message in schools and media, and it's a huge problem. According to Gallup, four in 10 Americans now embrace some form of socialism. Put another way, they reject the American dream. Perhaps they think that government control of the economy would magically wipe out student loans and healthcare premiums? But at what cost? High taxes, fewer jobs, imperiled small businesses? Conservatives know that there won't be enough money to deliver on all those free promises. There never is. As Margaret Thatcher once said, the problem with socialism is that you eventually run out of other people's money. And yet the UK still has the NHS. I guess Margaret didn't just try hard enough. And that's only half the trouble. Antifa radicals, Black Lives Matter activists, and many others want a full-scale overthrow of America's economic system, where you work hard, keep your nose clean, and improve the lives of your children and grandchildren. The fastest way to equality, they believe, is to take someone else's earnings, to tear down the system and replace it with politically engineered outcomes. Well, I would like to know her sources for this, but she doesn't cite any, so. Conservatives often lose when they make good faith accounting arguments, saying we can't afford it might be true, but it isn't persuasive to someone who is emotionally conditioned with bad information. A better way is for your daughter to appeal to morality. How can you embrace socialism when it crushes the human spirit? Where has it worked? The American dream sets people free by rewarding effort and creativity. There will always be wealth and equality, but freedom raises the quality of life for all. For all. I think the homeless people that I see on my way to work every day would probably disagree with that. But I guess they just didn't work hard enough. Socialism is based on envying and coveting. Teach your daughter not to envy and covet. Teach them to avoid the seven deadly sins that give rise to other bad behaviors. The naysayer's real disagreement is with capitalism, or as the founders might have called it, industriousness. Free markets make for free people because they allow individuals to pursue life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, or property, better than any other economic system. That's why entrepreneurship and innovation are largely an American phenomenon, and oppressive societies like China copy and steal what we produce. In America, you are free to disagree. If you don't like what's offered, you don't have to buy it. There are many choices. With socialism, people will have very little, if any, choice. Teach your daughter the moral case for capitalism and that hard work and competition produces opportunity and freedom. I think capitalism would work better if we followed our own laws about not allowing monopolies. Amending our flaws, embracing the future. So as I read through this book, or rather this chapter, I was really curious if she was going to mention any of, you know, America's flaws or just pretend that everything was hunky-dory. Well, <laughs> America isn't perfect, it never will be. 
but that is no reason to ignore the good in our country or erase our past. Is that what we're trying to do? Erase the past, not bring light to it and discuss it the way it should have been discussed for decades instead of whitewashing it as we were doing? One of the most disturbing trends in recent memory is the tearing down of historic statues. In both large cities and small towns, left-wing mobs have taken to the streets to, to exact retribution against symbols of American history. First, they stormed Confederate statu statues, setting anti-slavery as their cause. There are legislative processes to remove and replace these types of monuments in every state, but violent crowds overwhelmed police and weak elected leaders emboldened them by standing down. I'm a little surprised she mentioned the Confederate statues because given what she says about slavery, I would think she would be okay with them being torn down or at least relocated to a museum, which is where they should have been. But parents can counter these dangerous events by turning their attention to their daughter and teaching her that while slavery is part of our past and a terrible stain on our nation, it's also true that no other country has done more to end it. More than 600,000 American lives were given up to end slavery in America. Like all of us, the founders are a product of their time and they built the United States in a way that put slavery on the path to ultimate extinction, as Abraham Lincoln explained during the Lincoln-Douglas debates. American exceptionalism has never been about one group of people or another, but a special principle available to all. Slavery was a denial of those principles and it was fated to end because it was evil. Unfortunately, such topics have become so forbidden that many girls are afraid to talk about them, even when they know what they are being taught is wrong. What's unique about America is not that we had slavery, like many places in the world, but that we fought a war against ourselves to end it. Parts of the Middle East and Africa still have slavery today, and the Western Hemisphere had slavery long before the first Europeans arrived. America is imperfect, but not irredeemable. We have struggled mightily at times, but no other country has done more to realize such ambitious ideals. As for great American history books that teach real history, consider the following. A Patriot's History of the United States by Larry Schweikart and Michael Allen. The Myth of the Robber Barons by Bert Folsom, Harriet Tubman by Anne Petrie, Vindicating the Founders by Thomas West, Lydia Bailey by Kenneth Roberts, and My Antonia by Willa Cather. Get going. There is so much to love about America and there's so much to be thankful for. But freedom, as they say, isn't free. Teach your daughter to take service and sacrifice seriously and to take pride in expressing her patriotism. Parades, Independence Day celebrations, and other such fruits of the American dream can make for positive, formative experiences that help girls feel good about who they are and where they are from. There is plenty of negativity from the country's detractors, but it doesn't have to dictate your daughter's point of view. She will win by standing tall, working hard, and honoring all that makes America exceptional. So my takeaway from this chapter is that America is the world's police, and essentially no other countries exist, definitely not in the military way anyway. And there is no room for non-religious people in this country because our rights are God-given. And also, I mean, if you're so religious, why do you love your country so much? Is that not an earthly thing? But aside from that, so when a corporation goes woke, that is capitalism. In capitalism, nothing is sacred, everything is for sale. You don't get to, you know, be nice and choosy about things like that if you want to make sure you keep making money. You have to do what will sell the most. And right now, at least, that is being woke. Although on that note, I would like to caution people not to be fooled when someone rainbow washes their, con their country, their company image for June, because that doesn't necessarily mean that they are an LGBTQ plus friendly place. That just means they want to make sales to people that are part of that community and really throwing a rainbow on your logo is a very easy way to appeal to people. Also very lazy. I'd like to see more corporations, you know, walk the talk, but they're just in it to make money. And you know, that's fine. I don't, I'm not gonna look to a corporation for like my morals or anything like that, though I do try because I live in a capitalist society to vote with my dollar any way I can, which is why you'll not see me eating at Chick-fil-A. Well, that, and I really don't think their food is that good. But I mean, you can't be proud to be in a capitalist society and then be outraged when companies do things that they know will make them money. I don't know, this chapter was kind of boring and I didn't see anything good in it because I disagree with American exceptionalism. We are not more special than any other country. We meddle a lot in things that are none of our business, which creates problems for other countries and also takes choices away from their citizens. And I don't think we would like that if someone did that to us. And also we meddle in other countries and then blame their citizens when they try to come here for safety and opportunity. 
I'm going to include some links below about what the U.S. likes to do in other countries. And um, yeah, chapter four is hard work is a virtue, which I just saw like the second paragraph and I'm just like, what? But yeah, I'm going to stop this here because it's somehow like 40 minutes long. I'll try to edit it to like 20 minutes because I don't think this chapter really warrants that much time. Also, American exceptionalism is dangerous. If you think that your country is the best ever, you, you won't see any need to improve it. So you just rest on your laurels and think that everything is fine. And I would think that anyone who actually did seriously believe in American exceptionalism would just constantly be on the lookout for ways to improve their country because they think it's so great. Anyway, now that is seriously it for this episode. And I will see you for the next installment in two weeks from now. Have a good rest of your day and yeah, see you next week. Bye.